quick waff we wanted to do where we talked about uh, what we're doing in the ARM and ART64 backends uh, in this year and what's just gone into 4.8 and what's coming. Um, and we'd like to hear what people think are, the, are their pain points and see if we can do something about it, but I'm not going to commit to anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so basically what's new this year for us, uh, we've got AR64 now pretty much up in all the source trees. Uh, I've got a separate slide about uh, AR64, so we'll get to that. Uh, in terms of AR32, uh, what have we done? We've looked at pretty much performance on the Cortex-A7, the A15 and the M4. Uh, so we've done a bunch of work in that area, which uh, which improves performance for them. Uh, the A7 work was pretty much a pipeline description. It's an in-order core, and uh, we got pretty decent improvements with uh, with a sensible scheduler. Um, we've done quite a bit of uh, code size improvements. This is more to do with the M class or the microcontroller space. Uh, the 32-bit ARM backend supports uh, the A-class cores, which is pretty much in the tablet mobile space, but we also support the M-class cores, which is deep, which are deeply embedded. Uh, so, code size is quite important for them. Um, it, within that, we've got uh, some tweaks to Newlib, uh, essentially trying to rebuild Newlib so that um, people can get smaller code size in the libraries. Uh, people do care about the size of printf, for example, that comes out of Neolib. And uh, they've, they've done, uh, our team uh, based out of Shanghai has done quite a lot of work in uh, getting the code size down with Neolib Nano. Uh, we've also done some mid-end tweaks uh, uh, to help improve code size. They've been mostly to do with uh, reg register moves and uh, with regmove and in a few areas, reg rename, I think. Um, uh, there, there have also been general improvements in the back end to help with code size. Finally, uh, coming back to the uh, A side, uh, we've got RTX prologues and epilogues. It's, it was just a painful process to go through and fix it up. Um, in a number of places, we've uh, changed over to using STRDs instead of the old push-pop STM-LDM based prolog epilogues. It sort of helps performance on some of the newer cores like A15 and we expect it to do so going forward. Um, we've also been quite busy in enabling ARM V8A for 32-bit. So while uh, V8, uh, the V8 level of the architecture uh, is sort of shiny and new on the AR64 side, there's there's also a lot of improvement that's gone into the 32-bit side. So we've been working on enabling uh, a lot of those instructions, uh, some of which are uh, uh, FP SIMD instructions and uh, load acquired store release to sort of match with what's on the A64 side. Uh, the other thing we are working on is uh, deprecating complex IT blocks. Um, in Thumb 2 or Thumb 32, um, We've got conditional execution with uh, with a set of IT blocks. Uh, we've now restricted them to be 16-bit instructions only in V8A. It sort of helps with performance and the uh, microarchitects like it. So uh, we're going that way. Uh, so that has meant a significant rewrite in, and significant churn in the back end. Um, this is going to come into 4.9, basically. Uh, Could you say a more about Newlib Nano? Because that changes the Newlib substantially. Next also. slide. Next okay. slide. So Newlib Nano is essentially Newlib optimized for code size for extremely small system. Uh, some of our me measurements show that for something as simple as Hello World, we've got up to 90% code size reduction by just choosing the right versions of printf and so on. 
Well, uh, it's not so much printf as, as getting rid of the overhead of things that the, the standard startup code would normally pull in. Um, standard re requirement is that you can support all at, at exit, and there are links from the startup code yeah. directly into at exit. At exit pulls in malloc, etc., etc. And the next thing you know is is that your program, which is two lines long, has pulled in 40 or 50k of data out of the library. So by reworking the startup code. Uh, we can eliminate 90% of that. Yeah. Yeah, that means that means on, on a bare metal system where we've got microcontrollers which have got 32k of flash on them. You haven't got space in there for an overhead of 30 odd k of, uh, of startup code. So, um, the no, when, when we're talking about the hello world, it's like printf, but this is you probably optimize it. Well, that's uh, yeah. So yes, we would. Have, that's a, that ninety percent saving is assuming that the printf has been turned into a puts. Um, yeah. But even still, there are still a lot of overheads that are related. If you put printf back in by actually trying to print something using the printf formatting, your code will go up. Um, but even then, we've changed things so that printf now doesn't bring in all the floating point libraries by default. It will only do that if you add an extra room to the, to the link line to, to reference the floating point support code. This means that you don't have to mess around changing your whole source base to use iPrintf, uh, which also has the consequence that you've got a bit of code over here using uses iPrintf, a bit of code has to use printf. Now you've got <coughs> two versions of printf in your application. With, with the technique we've got here, we can actually make iPrintf equal to printf and you, you only get the overheads once. This is all generic code, apart from some minor changes to the startup headers. So in theory, this could be applied to other platforms as well. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, good. Uh, so the other thing we've done is, you know, reduce printf overhead, um, which is pretty much what Richard just covered with respect to printf, iprintf, and the whole load stuff there. Uh, We've, we've also found that malloc was taking up quite a bit of space, so there's a low size overhead uh, malloc that's now gone into newlib. Um, and we've got some proposed changes to the use of at exit during startup. I'm not too familiar with all the details in this. Um, uh, most of it is now upstream and being discussed on the newlib list, so if people are interested, they can go look it up there as well. But from what you're saying, this is something that because you've made generic any other architecture, you can make this up. Yes, pretty much. Pretty they much. need to change some of their startup code in the CLT0 yeah. yeah. but other than that, yes, it's, yes, there will it's be not some specific. Yeah. There will be some porting work involved, but you know, that's, that's expected. Right. Any other questions on Newlib Nano while we're there? Okay. Uh, moving on to ART64, uh, this is our 64-bit uh, toolchain port. We've got the basic compiler support and the toolchain support in all the necessary uh, repositories. It was in 4.8, so uh, we're, we're there. Uh, we've got glibc uh, having gone in from Linaro. And uh, if people want to play with AR64 uh, right now, there is a free model available from the ARM website. So if you want to use, if you want to try out AR64, you, you can try it out on, on the model. You can even boot Linux on it if you're feeling particularly brave and you've yeah. got enough time to, to do it. Yeah, go ahead. And a suitably big, big enough uh, host machine. Yeah. So what's next on AR64? Uh, we've, we've got ILP32 coming. Uh, there is uh, now an initial port, uh, which is bare metal. Uh, the patches are under review uh, upstream, and they should be hitting the trees pretty soon. Uh, we are pretty much planning on doing the initial port, uh, but beyond that, we, we would like community involvement to complete the port. Uh, uh, that's that's pretty much where we are. Uh, we have focused uh, 
on AR64 pretty much on enhancing the ISA coverage, uh, making sure we're using all the instructions the architecture provides. Uh, there are a whole load of uh, vector instructions that we don't use right now, and uh, there might be need for some improvements to the vectorizer uh, to, to, uh, to make use of these instructions. Uh, these are essentially uh, SysD kind of instructions that can operate on individual lanes. So we expect that uh, we can use this for some kind of re remainder loop vectorization uh, or the tail of uh, or the tail of the loops. Um, the other thing we are kind of interested in is making sure that neon intrinsics keep improving. Uh, uh, we've we've got a number of patches that try to teach the mid end more about the intrinsics rather than keep them as calls all the way till they just get expanded. Uh, and we see that as a good migration path for people who have uh, code that they want to migrate from A32 to A64. Uh, the intrinsics are backwards compatible. So really, you could, in theory, use the same um, intrin intrinsics in your programs and just move it on to A64. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is uh, optimizations for our cores. Uh, we, are, we are interested in the Cortex A57 and A53, which are our uh, first generation 64-bit cores. Uh, the goal we have is to try and share to some extent the pipeline models and some of the cost tables between the ARCH32 and the ARCH64 backends. Uh, we realize this is something that's not been done in GCC before. But uh, we figure we can we can try and use that to some we, we can try and leverage on that to some extent and 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 get, and see if we can reuse our uh, pipeline descriptions across. Um, we are not looking to merge the two backends. I'd like, to, yeah. Can you just briefly, for those of us uneducated about this, what is the difference between the fifty-seven and the fifty-three? Like roughly. Uh, the fifty-seven is an out-of-order code. Uh, the 53 is an in-order superscalar code. Yeah, that's that's the fundamental difference. Okay. Cool. Um, we we already have some support for Cortex A53 in the ARCH32 backend. We've got we've got some pipeline descriptions in there. Uh, we'd like to see how we can reuse that in the A64 backend. Uh, we don't want to merge the two backends because. There's a lot of legacy in the A32 backend, and it's not really relevant in the in the A64 backend. We've gone through all those discussions last year when we were uh, when we were looking at contributing the A64 port. So I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but yeah, uh, if we manage to do all the rearchitecture properly, then the, the compiler should be able to support multiple backend targets, and that's where we'd like to see it going. Um, in terms of ARCH32, uh, what's next? Uh, we, look, we already have some initial Cortex A53 support. Uh, we also are looking at uh, putting in support for Cortex A12 and A57. A12 is our latest uh, mid-range core. It's, it's not extremely out of order, but it still needs some, some kind of scheduling descriptions and some kind of tuning work that needs to be done. Uh, we are looking at reworking the RTX costs calculation. There are numbers in there which are just lies and damned lies. Uh, <laughs> uh, I use that about benchmarking a lot, but I think that's also true about some of the costs in, in the back end. And, and in general, the way in which uh, we use costs all over the place in GCC. Uh, there are there are times when you have to give wrong. There are times when you have to give address costs different depending on whether you're whether you're being called from IV ops or whether you're being called from the RTL optimizers. And these are areas that we uh, that we'd like to try and improve. We, we want to go and beat up on the front end part and uses of costs, but until we put the truth into the back end, it's very hard <laughs> to go and say the front end is wrong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So we'd like to get there. Um, the other work we're doing is trying to rework our instruction attributes in the A32 backend that I use for scheduling. Uh, this is another thing that will help us start sharing pipeline descriptions with ARP64. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's another work in progress that's going on right now. We expect to finish that for 4.9. Uh, at least the reworked instruction attributes would be something we expect to finish for 4.9. Uh, we've done a number of performance-oriented tweaks, and we are in the process of doing so for some of our recent cores. These include the A50, A15 and the A7, uh, which are kind of in the market right now. And uh, we'll, we've found a number of cases where uh, our immediate handling with HI and QI modes isn't all that great. Uh, we tend to zero and sign extent where we shouldn't be, with, which results in wrong costs and things not getting CSE'd properly and uh, yeah. We've got a number of uh, places where we've noticed this, so I'd like to go there. Um, in terms of uh, the backend changes, that's probably it. Um, if you've got any questions, maybe I can take it now. Um, just the backends, if anybody has anything. We can still go for questions at the end. The other changes we are looking at are, this is sort of covering some of the work that's also ongoing in Linaro. Uh, we're looking at trying to turn on LRA for both ARCH32 and ARCH64, and I believe Ivan's been in touch with uh, Vlad. Um, so, but we'd like to see how LRA behaves for um, all of the backends within ARCH32. So it's not just ARM state or thumb32, it's also this wacky thumb one, which is uh, which is quite register staffed. Uh, like yeah, probably. Yes. MIP 16, some would say, is a copy of thumb. Yes, it is. <laughs> and micro is a copy of thumb too. <laughs> that I care about, either, either of those three, anyways. Yeah. Or four. Yeah, essentially, essentially the ARM target is already three backends rolled into one. One of the reasons we didn't want to put AR64 in there is it was just in yet another one. Um, yeah. uh, register allocation is going to be one of those areas mm. where we've got to get it right for all three before we can swap it up. Yes. Um, in terms of the other bit that we are, uh, that Lenaro is interested in or is looking at, uh, there's a whole raft of stuff to do with conditional compares. Uh, right now, the way in which we put out conditional compares is is almost all in the back end and it relies on having a pretty high branch cost so that you can sort of... Uh, and it relies on combined working the way we want it to rather than the way it wants to. Combine, <laughs> <laughs> that funny thing. Uh, yes. So, yes, yeah, so yeah. it's very easy for combine to grab the first instruction from a conditional, a potential conditional compare sequence, merge it with something else, and then you're left with something that now generates a, a whole load of valid but rather insane instructions to do the same same effect. Yeah. And then there's no way for the optimizers to recover from that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Zero extracts. Mm, similar way. It's one of these things where if we had sensible idioms in the mid-end that we could use during the expand to generate conditional compares directly, we could solve the problem without having to worry. Um, the other thing we've sort of observed is that um, the vectorizer these days, uh, the vectorizer just peels generally for alignment. and. The ARCH32 target in general is a strict alignment target, but NEON can support misaligned axis. Uh, so peeling for alignment isn't a good thing. We've got, we went through a cycle of just turning it off, but that caused carnage in the test suite, um, but improved performance in general. Um, uh, we've had a few patches and uh, I think it's been going around with Richie about uh, getting a proper cost model in. And I think we've done that, so we should be looking at the next steps to get peeling for alignment working. So I think Lenaro is looking at getting those patches upstream and discussed anyway. 
the other thing that they're working on is trying to reduce the amount of redundant zero sign extensions that uh, that happen in in the compiler. Um, we've got a number of cases where we put out zero sign extensions and there is no way of eliminating them at the RTL level. So the idea is to try and teach VR to use VRP information at expand time to decide what needs to be done. That's again a set of patches that should help other targets in similar situations. And uh, yeah, it's being discussed upstream. Right. Uh, quite, quite a few problems that we've noticed uh, while looking at performance. I'm, I'm sure that this isn't a surprise for uh, a lot of you, but um, uh, yeah, th I thought we should just throw it out there and see what people thought. Uh, the problems we've got is... I'm working on the last one right now. I will be working on that soon. Okay. The last, the branch cost issue. Okay. Looking into that. Okay. That's great then. Uh, so, some of the problems we've noticed is that uh, the vectorizer is trying to align some of the loops in some cases. We can we can get examples out and uh, talk through them. Uh, Bin Cheng, one of our uh, engineers, has been looking at a whole load of problems with IV opts and the way it sometimes constructs addresses and looks at costs again. Surprise, surprise, costs. Um, it's it's uh, it's something where we don't seem to be constructing proper canonical RTL as well uh, that backends recognize. So we're working through that, and we should have some patches out shortly. Um, auto increment is just a bugbear. It's uh, it's something that I think the compilers just bolted on on top, and. It, it works at times and other times it just doesn't work. Um, uh, we've got a few other prob things we've noticed like address reassociation or general uh, reassociation type issues where um, I think a lot of the reassociation we do at the tree level is pretty much lexicographic. It's the standard thing that you have in the textbooks. But there are some recent papers that talk about uh, trying other techniques for reassociating so that you get, uh, you can detect equivalences that aren't lexicographic ordering based. Uh, it sort of depends on the order in which you see the expressions or, or you construct the expressions. Um, and of course, uh, lies, damn lies, and costs, really. Um, so, yeah, that's. So that's really it. So people have questions, I'm happy to take them. And maybe we can throw this for some kind of discussion. Uh, uh, my, my, the issue I want to bring up is not technical in any way. It's more of a community perspective. Uh, it has to do with the simulator that we are offered to, to run an AR64. It is not free software. That's a total showstopper for me. It's like, go away, you're not welcome. Okay. What, what, can, what can ARM do to, to, to prove that for, for the free software community? So there's no one who's yeah. working yeah. on a free software one. Oh, there are. Yeah. Uh, Sporting Edge, the RFC. QMU. QMU. There are QMU. patches for QMU now that support AR64. Yeah. It's, it's a tricky area, um, and it's all, it's all right around patents, really. And there's not a lot ARM can do about it. Well, there's not a lot ARM's lawyers will let ARM do about it. <laughs> but do you have a QMU that uh, works yet, or it's still... Uh, we don't have anything that's going to go public. So, there, so the host support stuff went off stream lately, but not necessarily the target support for QMU. It's work in progress to Lenaro. That's all I can say at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. Well, I know it went up. The host side went up because well, that's yeah. up. So yeah. I can at least say that. Yeah. 
Um, uh, Cavium also has their own internal simulator, but I don't think that's going to be released as free software either. How, how would Contrarian Simulator GDP? Uh, it's uh, certainly not. It's it's a different layer of simulator mm -hmm. that we're talking about, right? right? The simulator that exists. Uh, this, this, yeah. this, this, it, it almost has different purposes. So it, it's it's, it's all it's all lawyer related stuff, yeah. and it's it's a mi it's a minefield. Yeah, much as much as we as engineers yeah. might like to do something, it's, yeah. it's, we hear you, but. I can't give you an answer, I'm afraid. Yeah, and I can't give you an answer from Cabinet's point of view either. From the Cabinet assimilator, too. But, you know, we've done what we can, which is we've released a freely downloadable model. Which is, from the free software perspective, it's worse than nothing. <laughs> it can't be worse than nothing. It can. It, it takes away freedom, whereas nothing doesn't. Then use nothing. Uh, sorry, I have to disagree with you on that one. But let's <laughs> that that's, 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 one. Yeah. that's a highly slightly underrated question. Are you guys expanding the amount of performance target support in the newer ARM processors? So, for example, we have uh, in the Intel processor, we have the LBR, the last branch, and we're able to derive good profile guided information. I don't know. I think it also depends on, you know, there's there's more cores than that just the ARM cores, too. Yeah. Right. Or not. Yeah. Okay. You have to remember that ARCH64 is an architecture specification. Yeah. And while ARM is doing some implementations, it has licensed that specification um, at an architectural level to a number of partners, some of whom have announced their products, some of whom haven't, and therefore I'm not going to go through it. The, the list because uh, I wouldn't want to get something wrong in that respect. Um, the what what appears beyond the basic architecture, particularly in the area of performance counters, um, is to a large extent down to the architectural licensing and their implementation. So let me ask this question: the 32-bit architecture is there more plans for improving performance counters or uh, so in the 32-bit implementation? It's, yeah, well, it's, it's not really an area I know okay. to, yeah. to answer that question. Okay. The yeah. other thing I'd just say is that uh, you know, you've got the architecturally mandated performance counters. You also have implementation specific performance counters. Okay. So some of the stuff you might be looking for might already be in an implementation defined performance counter. Uh -huh. So, okay. So when you're looking for that information, you need to be looking at the architecture spec as well as the TRM for the core you're interested in. Uh, that's uh, that's at a higher level as to what I can say, but beyond that, uh, I don't know what the specific case is. Well, the, architect yeah, the, the architecture does mandate a certain number of um, performance type counters. Right, because in the Intel, Intel thing that has the last branch record has a stack of 16 things about the last 16 mm -hmm. branches taken. So you can actually derive really good uh, profile information just from that. That so sounds related to what Cabin has in their Audion 3, so maybe Cabin will have it in their Thunder. Okay. Okay. But I don't, I can't comment on that, even if I knew. Okay. At least from a Cabin point of view, I don't know what the ARM cores have. It doesn't ring a bell, is all I can say. Okay. <laughs> Are you doing anything with the cost model issues? We're, well, the work that we're doing at the moment is to rework the back end um, code so that it's it's table driven, okay. and that we can then plug in sensible tables for each CPU without having to ch change the code paths that are taken all the time. The, the problem we've got to date is because it's all uh, pointed to function, and you generate a new new function essentially to do the cost for this CPU. Uh, it doesn't. First of all, it doesn't scale very well. Secondly, it's hard to debug and, and to make into a sensible hierarchy of, of calls. Um, it worked quite well when there were a small number of calls with very minor differences, but it's, it doesn't work when you've got a dozen or more different CPUs that you have to support. Um, 
So we're going to change that, and then we're going to feed in some correct numbers into those tables for the, the various CPUs. Once we've got correct numbers in there, we can then start to go to beat up the, the mid-end code to make sure it's using those numbers in the correct way. At present, we can't rely on those numbers being coming out correctly, and therefore saying the front end is wrong is, is yeah. hard, because the answer is that your back end numbers are wrong. My experience with that is that, you know, RTA, construction selection and register class selection and all that is controlled by these tables in ways which don't make sense, which I would, exactly. yes. yeah. I would be happy to lie if I could figure out what the lie well, would be the, to get the, 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 so. Yeah, the maximum always is if you lie to the compiler, don't be surprised when it turns around and bites you. Yes. Um, yes. And over time, yeah, we, we've got a lot of lies in the ARM back end at present. We're trying to get rid of them <coughs> so that we can go and say, look, when we put the truth in, the front end does stupid things. Now go and fix the front end so it actually uses these costs in a correct manner. But it's a bit of a chicken and egg type thing. Uh, and the first phase of this is to get the cost in a point where we can drop in some sensible numbers, show that the front end is wrong. And that's easier actually to do if they're table driven. Because you can just pick up a table which has got the truth in it point to that and, and then say those are clearly the wrong um, the wrong answers. Of course I'm not saying we want to lie even <laughs> in the tables. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the first step. But we might have to lie. Yeah. 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 But we may have to do a generation but, which is not the truth. And then but say or at, least the, the, at least the goal should be that we uh, make exactly. the mid ends quicker. Yeah. Okay. It's easy to understand when you are lying when it's encoded in the tables than if it's encoded in a large bit of bespoke code that's sort of walking down and said, oh, let's just return 32 here. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's well, it's, you know, two instructions, whatever. Yeah, they're about. Yeah, that's Any other questions or? Um, are, is anybody looking into um, using the instruction, uh, zero extent? Zero extracts a little bit better? In AR64 yeah. or AR64? AR64. I'm sure we had, we did mention earlier on that more creative uses of instructions was something on our target list. Right. Um, yeah. And we're, yeah, we, the state that we are today in AR64 is we have a compiler which is producing architecture and the correct code. Right. Um, and we've, we've been focusing on adding features to handle more of the requirements of the community for building yeah. out a, a, an ecosystem. Where we have to go next is as implementations start to become sufficiently well defined that we, we know what the, the performance characteristics mm -hmm. are, we need to start beating up on the performance issues of the code, putting in correct costs yeah. that reflect reality, and then doing the, the other tweaking that's needed to get sensible code out of, sensible rather than correct code out of the back end. Yeah. I know I'm going to be working some on that stuff. There's, there's still a number of patterns that, that we could write that yeah. will help with um, code generation. I thought Ian Bolton posted a few patches recently yeah, in, the, yes. in that yeah. area. So yeah. I would, I think well, it's I best to double check. Well, I was in the middle end stuff. Okay. No. Because of I can combine. I've tried. I've tried to do some of that stuff. Yes. Yeah. In respect with MIPS, but it actually carries over in this case. The, there was a major improvement went in recently in that Zero Extract can now support more than one mode size. And that was influenced by me, actually. Yeah. 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 So that's something that we do need to make sure we're, we're properly exploiting. Yes, you are. Guys are. Yeah. I already looked. Yeah, good. I already okay. looked. I already looked to make sure yeah. that's what's yeah. correct. Because I backported yes. the patches to 4.7, which didn't have that. Mm -hmm. so. Is that something you've looked in the A32 backend as well? No. no. I, well, Kevin doesn't have it. Does, yeah, that's fine. I'm just it's trying uh, to. It's less significant in A32 because we only really have one yeah. Um, yeah. natural machine okay. size, uh, word size. Yes. Whereas in A64, because of the way the architecture is structured, 32 bit and 64 bit values essentially are equally well supported. And you don't want to do things at 64 bit width unless you really have to. Yeah. You know, some might 
a lot of implementations is probably not going to make a performance difference. And some of it might. Yeah. Are there any other general concerns about the tools? Things that we need to be picking up? Sorry? Simulator is too slow. <laughs> All simulators are too slow. Yeah. The real life of that is what it's just compiled to all of them. Couples, well, I don't want to use this so fast. No. Okay. Okay. I think we're done then. Okay. Thank you.